let's talk about once you got the alfalfa how to keep it. All right. But I'm going to pick up from that point on, and I'm going to talk about something we've already briefly touched on, which is weed management during establishment. So first rule is, is that growing up on the farm, my dad taught me control what you can control. There's so much about farming that's out of your control that the best that you can do is to try to control the things that you can control. Now, that does not always mean we need to operate with a herbicide. I mean, alfalfa, as I mentioned, is a very tough species. And unless it's being shaded over, uh, we probably don't really need to, to uh, do anything during the establishment if we're establishing in the fall. However, we may need to do some mowing or, or grazing, selective grazing, uh, to, to control that as well. The second thing is, is related to that, determine if treatment is warranted. So treatment may not be warranted. It may look pretty tough, um, especially for things like, for example, henbit or ryegrass. It may look like it's really competitive with it, but the reality is it's a, a short-lived comp uh, competitive uh, period. Now, if it is a Roundup Ready crop, you can use uh, uh, glyphosate up to 44 fluid ounces of the acre. That's a really, really heavy dose. Uh, but if we're growing this in intermixed with Bermuda grass, to me, the, the fit for Roundup Ready is really limited to the establishment phase. After that, you, you, there may be some selective times that you would need it, but um, this is really more for if you're growing it as a monocultor. If it is conventional, you could consider using Pursuit or Raptor. Both of those have labels on it for uh, broadleaf controls. As pictured here, there's a lot of uh, wild mustard that is uh, at play here and, and that could be something that would get above the alfalfa and do some competition there so uh, using pursuit or raptor to control that could be useful. Now if you're in a commercial hay business, uh, weed free hay is going to be at a premium. So that changes the calculus. So if you're really trying to produce uh, clean cuts every time that's completely weed free, especially for square hay for the horse hay market, then you may want to consider uh, all of these options that are on the table. Okay, let me walk you through different uh, scenarios. So if we are going conventional teal, full, full on land preparation, full on uh, uh, tillage, and just alfalfa, okay? There are a few options here uh, for pre-plant incorporated herbicides that keep it from uh, the weeds from being a problem. Probably the best one on this list is the most expensive one on the list, uh, Treflam, and it will probably uh, give you the best results overall. Okay, uh, but this would be a scenario really where you're talking about commercial hay operation where you got to have that uh, clean from the very beginning. Now, pre-emergent herbicides can be used after the establishment year. So it's fully established, you can use things like Prout, just like we use it in, in uh, the meatgrass hay fields, we can use Prout. Uh, particularly for um, ryegrass control, for example, in the wintertime. Um, maybe some other, uh, maybe even uh, pigweed control, for example, this will give you some options there. Grassy weed control is, uh, uh, we've got a few more tools in the toolbox there, except for when we're interceding it into Bermuda grass. If we are interceding into Bermuda grass, then virtually none of what I'm talking about here is going to work. Um, things like uh, Post and Post Plus, Select and Select Max uh, can be used to suppress uh, uh, grass growth. Now, that from time to time, we have a lot of uh, ryegrass competition with the alfalfa in the, the establishment phase, and folks will want to come in, um, even in, in, even in uh, uh, establishment the meter grass, and come in and try to control the grasses there. We've kind of hit or miss with that during establishment with either post or select. I have had some cases, even on university farms, where it has gotten burnt back. The alfalfa has been burnt back pretty severely. Uh, with uh, the post or select. So my preference is, if it's ryegrass, unless it's just really, really competitive, and if that's the case, you may need to take the cutting off, but uh, uh, just let it ride. It should do just fine. Between cuttings is probably your best option for weed control. If you're having real problems with weed control, uh, there's a time window there of about five days between cuttings. <coughs> So when you cut it, you've got about five days, according to the label, to come in with Paraquat, Verboxone, Firestone, Firestorm, or whatever, um, 
and, and you can burn back the weeds as they begin to, to uh, come back, and it does not affect the alfalfa. And if you got the meter grass underneath it, that's not enough to really hurt it either. So uh, it will come back from that. That's a really very useful tool if you get into some really bad situations. Uh, dormant sprays. We do have some products that we can use, Velpar, for example, for dormant applications. I've never yet seen a situ situation in Georgia where we need to use this. Uh, when I was in Kentucky growing up, we would use Velpar occasionally for some problem weeds, but uh, most of the time in, in Georgia, we don't need to worry about that. Okay. Broadleaf weed control options uh, from a post-emergent standpoint. 2,4-D-B, uh, this is not regular 2,4-D, this is 2,4-D-B, Uterac, uh, which we, we use in other broadleaf crops sometimes as well. Um, Pursuit, Raptor, those are the, the those three, 2,4-D-B, uh, Pursuit, and Raptor are the three most common ones that we would use uh, for broadleaf weed control. Now, I've talked about all these options, but the reality is, is that uh, outside of an occasional use of paraquat, as I mentioned, we rarely have that many weed problems that we need to address when we're growing Bermuda grass with alfalfa. I'm not saying that there are not going to be a few weeds out there, but generally speaking, they're not problematic enough for the average cattle producer to be all that concerned about. Now, if you're a commercial hay operator, again, that changes the calculus. Uh, but, but many times that's not going to be an issue for us. If you do have a specific weed problem that you're trying to deal with, uh, we have uh, pest management ratings on all of the herbicides, all the op options that we have. You'll see uh, your county agents, you know, see Luke or Seth or one of your county agents uh, nearby uh, to go through that. If they don't know the answer, then they'll contact one of us who can, can find out that information for you. So let's talk about insect management. One of the most common uh, issues in the spring of the year is uh, alfalfa weevil. Now, alfalfa weevil is an issue. We are going to occasionally need to treat for that uh, one way or the other. But alfalfa weevil is not the beast that it once was. We now have some really good, cost-effective, very safe chemistries to be able to use to control alfalfa weevil. The synthetic pyrethroids that we use to control stem maggot can be very effective at controlling alfalfa uh, weed. Uh, same goes for potato leaf hopper, although this one is a much rarer bird. We don't really have as much problem with potato leaf hopper uh, in Georgia, but occasionally we will. Um, we, we oftentimes will have uh, three-cornered leaf hopper uh, damage that will occur. Um, that actually does more damage to the stem than the, uh, the leaves will show the effects of that. The leaf hopper actually will uh, stick its little sucking part there, the, the proboscis of that insect, into the midrib of the leaf, and from every point back out of that toward the tip of the leaf will be yellow. Now a lot of folks will often confuse this with potassium deficiency. Potassium deficiency is also on the leaf margins, but it's just at the leaf margins. It doesn't originate in the midrib. So just uh, uh, mark that in your book if you are out looking at it. If you see this kind of pattern right along the edges of that, that leaf, then that's going to be potassium deficiency most likely. I've already talked a little bit about blister beetles, um, so I'm going to skip over this. But just suffice it to say there is a publication in our, in our, uh, uh, on our pub page that has all those details that I just mentioned earlier about blister beetles. And, how they're relatively a non-issue for us here in Georgia. So we have several insecticide options. Pretty much <coughs> most of these are the same ones that we use for Bermuda grass uh, production or other pasture management. Uh, seven, uh, which is rarely used anymore because it's so expensive, as is Lanate. Lanate is extremely expensive. Uh, things like Mustang Max, Karate Z, the, these, these bottom three are all synthetic pyrethroids. Very common, relatively inexpensive, usually less than three, four dollars an acre in product cost. Malphon is a little bit more expensive, a little bit more potent, um, uh, but uh, very, very effective. Uh, generally speaking, all those are going to be very effective against most of the insect problems that we, we deal with. Now, alfalfa, just like any other forage crop, can be impacted by armyworm. So uh, in the armyworm season, we may need to go out and, and treat it very similar to what we do with uh, uh, the meter. 
However, alfalfa does not, uh, is not impacted by the Bermuda grass stem mat. And usually the Bermuda that's there is minimally impacted by Bermuda grass stem mat as well. Uh, so it's, it, to me, this is actually one of the good options or good opportunities there of interceding a, uh, alfalfa into Bermuda grass to kind of lessen the, the risk of Bermuda grass stem mat. So we've already talked about taking off the first cutting right. You talked a little bit about that. Uh, so let me just kind of skim over to the, to, you may have even talked about this, but it bears repeating again. There are, in my opinion, seven keys to keeping alfalfa in stand once you've got it. The first one is the most important. Applying potassium fertility, as, as Joe talked about before. Potash you know, fertility is extremely important. The second one is very similar too, is follow the potash recommendation. And the third is fertilize the potash as recommended. <laughs> and any other combination of those that you can work. So those top three really are, uh, you know, you, they say in, in, uh, in the real estate business, it's location, location, location. Well, in alfalfa, it's potash, potash, potash. Those are very, very crucial elements to this. The fourth one is applying boron and molybdenum. So many of these micronutrients are crucial for uh, nitrogen fixation. Uh, boron and molybdenum are very important in the biochemistry of, of nitrogen fixation, so it's in, important to have those out there. Usually, uh, boron is uh, available in things like soluble. You can use borax. You know, regular old uh, 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 borax can be used as well. But uh, molybdenum is one that is often not very common around. Uh, you can use it, you can apply it. You can actually buy sodium molybdenate off of Amazon if you, if you can't find it locally. And you can mix that in with the, uh, the fertilizer or um, and the other, there are many other ways of distributing it out in the field. Uh, but normally it's mixed in with the fertilizer. Once per year is really all you need to worry about on molybdenum. The boron may need to be applied a couple times a year. What I really think is important to do, particularly if you're in the commercial hay business, if you're removing a lot of hay, it's important to understand what is being removed and what's in that forage. And so going in and taking a tissue sample one week prior to the second cutting of each year is crucial to determine what other fertility needs might be out there. So this is kind of like, I always use the analogy for soil testing, it's like the dipstick in your, in your engine block. Uh, that tells you if you got oil or not, but the, the plant tissue analysis actually tells you if you're getting oil all around the engine block. It's your oil pressure gauge. So it tells you if those nutrients are getting where it needs to be. And then the sixth issue is to scout and spray for alfalfa weevils in February and March and fall on your worms during the summer. And then the seventh issue, don't skimp on the nitrogen on the potash fertilizer. <laughs> very, very crucial. Now, we say all this about potash, but the reality is if you look at their soil test recommendations for Bermuda grass and the recommendations for alfalfa, they're fairly close to one another. There's not that much difference between the two. Let me, let me illustrate that to you uh, in, a, in an example. Now, there's a lot of, a lot of numbers that I'm going to throw up here, but let me show you. Uh, uh, this is varying levels of potassium. Okay, as starting at 100, going up to 350 in your soil test potash level. And then we have varying levels of soil phosphorus up here at the top, going from, you know, kind of marginal up to fairly good, and then this would be anything higher than that would be, would be in the high category. So if we look at the total input and in fertilizer based on these cost assumptions, which are relatively close for where we're at right now, and let's just assume for a moment that we have medium phosphorus and medium K. So medium K here, uh, let's just say 30 phosphorus. And so our total fertilizer budget, if we fertilize according to the soil test recommendations, our total fertilizer budget is $211 per acre. Okay. Now, if we do that same thing for alfalfa and medium K and medium phosphorus, then our soil test recommendations would call for a total of $137 per acre. All right, so we have roughly about $80, $75, $80 or so there to work with. 
It's, it's cheaper to grow the alfalfa fertilizer-wise than straight Bermuda grass. Why? This is the interactive portion of the program. <laughs> Why is it cheaper to grow alfalfa in the Bermuda grass than Bermuda grass alone? Less nitrogen. Less nitrogen, exactly. In this scenario, we don't need nitrogen. In this scenario, we're going to need 200 pounds of nitrogen or more, all right? In this case, we actually uh, use 250. But the point remains is that uh, we, we really are cutting out a significant cost of production here by cutting out that nitrogen. So we have some margin to work with, and it's, it's cost effective to grow alfalfa with Bermuda grass. As I mentioned earlier at the station in Watkinsville, our research station, we don't have any Bermuda grass that's just straight Bermuda grass anymore. All of our Bermuda grass now actually has alfalfa with it. Now, I just want to reiterate how important good fertility is because one of our primary objectives here is to have a really good root storage system. More so here in the south than anywhere else, we need to make sure we've got good carbohydrates and good nitrogen reserves in the plant. And that is in the taproot of this plant. And the way we do that is with high phosphorus and potash. Uh, if we look at low phosphorus and potash conditions over here, this is a picture from uh, Wisconsin, but the, the results would be even more exaggerated here if we looked at the difference. You can see how much bigger these tap roots are compared to uh, uh, the low fertility areas. And so let's talk about this conceptually for a moment so you kind of get what's going on. Um, here is the soil surface, and as we're, we're growing that crop, the yield increases over time here as it matures, and I'm going to throw up some, some um, growth stage indicators here. So this would be the regrowth initiation, the very beginning of a regrowth period. Uh, this would be at a six to eight inch height, and this is uh, at the bud stage once we start really beginning to reach the reproductive stage. And then this would be the full flower stage once we are completely flowered out. And we'll, when we get to the field this afternoon, uh, that stand is about 50 to 60 percent bloom at this point. And so we're kind of more on, the, on this full flower side, almost to that full flower side. Now what I want to point out is what you're not seeing in the roots. What you don't see is that the root reserves, initially, it's mobilizing those root reserves to grow back. Right? It's got its savings account that it's tapping into to start growing back. And then once it reaches about six to eight inches tall, it's starting to put money back down into the savings account. All right? And until it gets back to about the bud stage, it really has not uh, 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 reached where it started at. Okay? And if we really want to push nutrients back into that, we, we will allow it to grow a little bit later to mature a little bit more. So if we cut it at the bud stage, which is a little bit early compared to what we would like to do, and this would be more like a dairyman would in Wisconsin, for example, they would cut it at the bud stage. What we want to do is carry it just a little bit further here so that we can produce more reserves down in the roots. This is a, a very busy graph, but let me walk you through this. This was some work that was done in New Zealand, but it's really, I think, uh, it speaks volumes to what can happen for us as well. Now, what this is looking at is crown and taproot. This is the, the total below ground portion of that, uh, of that forage, of that plant. And what it's looking at is the mass of that root and these were grazed, this bottom graph was grazed every 28 days for four days, all right? Uh, so that would be similar to uh, making a hay cutting every 28 days. And this was grazed every 38 days for four days. And so uh, there's 10 extra days worth of, of growth that's going on here. And you can see what's happened here with the root is much, much bigger as a result than down here. This, this uh, dashed line represents the average. It's a good reference there. So overall it's been able to maintain more uh, growth, uh, not only the top growth but also below ground as well. If we look at the concentration of starch, that's the carbohydrate that's primarily being stored there, 
in this very short interval, we never really were able to get back up to scratch except for the very late part of the summer. Versus here, uh, with a little bit more growth to it, especially during the summer, we were able to get back uh, uh, quite a bit of uh, starch. Uh, so it's increasing its savings account, increasing the size of those roots by letting it go just a little bit longer, especially if we do that late summer and autumn. So if we go in in um, uh, July, August, maybe even early September, and we allow that to really get a little bit more mature, let that be our mature cutting, um, if we go maybe to about 25 or 30 percent bloom instead of cutting at 10 percent bloom, we're going to be stuffing more um, carbohydrates and nitrogen back down into the roots and it's going to make for a healthier plant. Same thing for nitrogen uh, that we saw with the, the starch content. Again, if we, if we allow for that later regrowth uh, in the summer months, the late summer and early autumn will we'll come out better from a standpoint of recovery of that, uh, that crop. Questions about that? Yes, sir.